one of the really great things about being a fiction writer is that you get to make up people and make up situations. And occasionally, you get somebody to pay you for that. Uh, another great thing is that you get to pick through the stories of your life and the stories of other people's lives to get at the truth about the people and situations that you've made up. Uh, the events of real life um, are great starting points and middle points and sometimes ending points for writers to use in getting at the truth about imaginary people. I really love those moments when uh, some striking event or some unique person uh, presents themselves to me and demands to be turned into a, a telling detail in my work. Uh, sometimes it's in a conversation with a friend, or sometimes it's reading an article in the newspaper, uh, or something I overhear while I'm listening in on the next table at the restaurant. You know, it can happen in a million different ways. And to me, it's a really exciting thing because it makes writing seem like hunting for buried treasure. You know, something strikes your eye or your ear, and then a grand adventure is launched. Uh, whatever you find is yours, and how you use it is entirely up to you. The question, though, is always why. You know, why should a writer pick a particular true story or detail uh, to use in their work? If you're paying attention, then you're going to encounter strange and interesting things all the time. So what makes one great real life detail make a story come alive when another great real life detail might stop the narrative dead in its tracks? Uh, it isn't enough that what you draw from real life is odd or funny or tragic. The thing that we writers have to focus on is whether or not a particular bit of real life creates a moment or illustrates a trait that feels authentic to the character and feels true to the circumstance that we've written. Um, in my first novel, I used a story that I remembered from my childhood as a way to acquaint the reader with a secondary character. Um, I chose that story because I felt it was a good way to tell the reader a number of things about this character in relatively few words. And uh, you know, because I like to tell stories, I'll tell you what the story is. Uh, it, it's about my great aunt Edith. And uh, she was the oldest of my grandmother's sisters. And she was a very old lady, even when I was a, a very young kid. And Aunt Edith and her husband were both very good-natured and kind people, and uh, they were married for well over 50 years, and, and quite happily, as far as I know. Um, and Aunt Edith's husband died one night while he was kneeling next to the bed saying his prayers. And rather than call 911, Aunt Edith made the decision to leave him there on his knees until the next day. And the following morning, uh, and Edith called her daughter, and she says, well, you know, your daddy died last night. And her daughter was very upset, of course, and she asked her mother, you know, is, is he at Stewart's? Uh, she, Stewart's is a funeral home that my family always used. And my family, being Baptist, were very, very excited about funerals, and they had <laughs> very high standards. And um, we always used Stewart's because Stewart's Funeral Home had a reputation for making the deceased look like they were really happy to be dead. <laughs> so anyway, so she, and Edith tells her daughter, no, he's not at Stewart's, he's still here. And uh, her daughter says, what do you mean he's still there? And she says, well, he's here beside the bed. And her daughter says, well, why? You know. <laughs> She got even more upset, and she wanted to know, you know why Aunt Edith hadn't called her or called someone to help her deal with all the things that had to be dealt with. And Aunt Edith said to her, well, if I called you, everybody would have come over. 
you and the pastor and all the grandkids would be running around. I figured your daddy would be just as dead if I left him till the next day and got a good night's sleep. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I loved that story when I was a kid. Um, you know, I loved it at first because it said so much about my Aunt Edith, who was one of the more odd people in a, in a collection of pretty peculiar family members. And I still love that story now, mostly because it has meant so many different things to me over the years. When I was very young, I thought of it as a horror story. You know, I, I was terrified by the notion that someone could just sleep next to a dead body. And later, I thought of it as a story about aging and the way that some older people are able to accept the inevitability of death with such ease that it loses the drama that younger people invest in it. And then later, I saw it as a story about marriage and the way that the passage of time makes us sometimes so completely comfortable with the changes in another person's body you know, it could be reading, reading glasses or love handles or surgical scars or whatever. You know, we're so comfortable sometimes that we can even accept that final change. Uh, you know, we, we, we get to the point where we, we get such comfort from the nearness of that person that no, no matter what their physical state is, we're, we're just happy to have them there. And, uh, you know, at, at different times, I've imagined all of those motives for Aunt Edith's behavior. But the interpretations I gave that story all assumed a basic level of decency on the part of the protagonist, uh, because I knew that my Aunt Edith was a decent person. When I became a writer, I looked at that story and many other favorite stories from my life, and I looked at them through a different lens. Viewing that story as a writer instead of as a devoted nephew, I asked myself, would someone, someone who is not my Aunt Edith, do the same thing she did? And why would they do it? If I took away the assumption of that character's decency, then she could leave that body beside the bed for a number of reasons. A character might leave her dead husband there overnight because she was so accustomed to ignoring him that she didn't <laughs> notice he was dead. <laughs> or she might have disliked him so much that it pleased her to have outlived him and she might have wanted him close by while she gloated all night. You know, or maybe this character is simply a sociopath and her husband's death wouldn't mean that much to her at all. You know, many years after um, Aunt Edith died, I wrote my first novel. And I used that story about her husband's death. I used it in a way that was more aligned with the interpretations that did not assume decency. Um, in my book, that story about my sweet but peculiar Aunt Edith became a story about narcissism I used the story to create a character who was so callous and so self-involved that sleeping next to her dead husband wasn't a big deal. Um, it was merely an inconvenience for her. She, well, it bothered her that his eyes were open and he was staring at her all night, but it really didn't upset her that much. There, there were other stories, both true and made up, that I could have used to acquaint readers with that same character um, who was a woman that I named Minnie. But the only thing that the reader knows about Minnie before her husband's death, which happens in the book exactly the same way it happened with Aunt Edith, uh, is the only thing that that, only things that the reader knows about Minnie guide them to assume that Minnie does not have the best of intentions. And her behavior is weird and shocking but it also seems logical, considering 
the little bit that the, that the reader knows about her. You know, this is a character who very well might leave her dead husband's body beside the bed, but definitely not because she can't bear to part with him. You know, when we search through the database of true stories that we all keep in our heads, the goal is to find a balance. We want to surprise the reader with something fresh, something that they couldn't have anticipated. But after that shock has faded, we want to leave the reader feeling that whatever that character did was entirely inevitable, no matter how surprising it was. Oh, sometimes a great story just won't cooperate with you. You know, no matter what you do to that story, you just can't make it work sometimes. You know, some of the best realized stories are deadly on the page when they're presented as fiction. Um, for me, when I'm writing and I find myself in, in that position, it's usually because I have fallen in love with the story so much that I forget that what's important is not the charm or humor or heartbreaking emotional impact of a particular real life detail, but whether that charm or humor or emotional impact comes across as truthful on the page. When we fail at our job to make the truth feel authentic in our fiction, the writing starts to feel like, like a rickety platform that we've constructed to support an unwieldy true story that we want to tell. I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have probably had the experience of being in a workshop or a writing group where a writer has defended an unsuccessful piece of writing with the excuse that, oh, it actually happened that way. You know, what that writer is, is saying essentially is that they're okay with the story failing. They just need to tell the world about the epiphany they had or about the really ugly breakup they had and they're using the story as an excuse to tell that. And that writer doesn't want to endure the risk of using real names or do the work that's involved in making the story com uh, consistently interesting. And the problem with this, of course, is that no reader cares whether something actually happened. If it, if it isn't authentic to the story, they don't want to read it. And if it doesn't feel true, the fact that it is true is completely inconsequential. The purpose of writing real life into fiction is to add another level of realism to the characters, to the dialogue, or to the plot. It's not so you can defend yourself from criticism by saying, oh yeah, it really happened that way. Uh, the reader just doesn't care and it's going to make the writing seem artificial. Uh, what we want is for the real life elements that we incorporate into our work to make the reader think both I can't believe that happened. And of, of course, it couldn't have happened any other way. Thank you. Thank you.